veritas vos liberabit, the, the truth will make you free. That's the, the motto of the college where I did my undergraduate degree. It's written above the doorways of a lot of the buildings. It is on the diplomas that we get. It, it's all over the place. But I wonder if students then or students now ever stop to notice it as they walk under it or walk by it or wherever else it may be. And indeed, whether we stop to wonder what it is Jesus means, what is this truth, and what kind of freedom is it that we are promised if we will believe in it? We as human beings are pretty loose and fast with truth if we want to be honest with ourselves. I, I'm becoming more and more accustomed to making a fool of myself as a scientist in my sermon, so why stop now? You may know that in medical research and scientific research in general, we propose that what we find in our research is truth, but only with lots and lots of conditions. You begin the study by saying, presuming that this is true and this is true and this is true, and that these other things are the way that we did them, then we can be reasonably sure this is correct. The usual standard of proof, at least in medical research, is 95%. If there's no more than one chance in 20 that we got it wrong, we're going to say that we got it right. Think about that the next time you open up a pill bottle. Chances are we decided that as long as there's no more than a 5% chance it'll kill you, it probably will do what we intended it to do. This is not a very strong measure of truth. And things don't get any better when we think about the law instead. For the most part, what we use in court cases is the standard of reasonable doubt. If a reasonable person would believe it, then it's probably true. All the better if 12 reasonable people would believe it, then we consider that it's probably true. And things really, really go downhill when we start to talk about popular media, politics, other places where we will believe almost anything, where we have come up with terms like truthy and truth-adjacent and if it isn't true, it ought to be, and other standards of deciding what we think is true. That isn't what Jesus is talking about. God doesn't speak truth. God doesn't act truthfully. God is truth. If you want to make a verb out of it, God truths. A way of thinking about this would be, once again, to go back to science just briefly, you may know, because I may have told you before, that somewhere in a secret vaulted room in France somewhere, there is a piece of metal that is exactly one meter long in the metric system, one meter. Uh, it's kept in a hermetically sealed case where the temperature and the humidity and everything are precisely the same all the time, so we'll know exactly what one meter is, and everything else is presumably measured against it, or at least it used to be till we discovered that everything made by human beings is ultimately flawed. And in fact, it expanded and contracted just like everything else, and so there really wasn't. But for centuries, all over Paris and elsewhere in France at least, and maybe elsewhere in the world, I don't know, there were places you could go where up on the wall there was a, a facsimile of this one perfect meter, and you could measure against that and decide whether what you had was truly a meter in length or not. There is some value in that, even if we realize that the human version doesn't work. The truth that Jesus is talking about, the truth that God is talking about, is the truth of that one perfect measure against which all other truth can be evaluated. You might say, well, that's great, but what does that mean? Normally, I can get away with, well, it's meant to fill in the blanks on your own when the Spirit moves you, but I will go into a little more detail, maybe, and say that I think where we find the measure of our own truth, where we find that ability to test our own truthfulness in a holy way against God is in the things that represent the truth of God, the mercy of God, the justice of God, the goodness of God, the love of God. If we will measure our love against God's love, we will discover how close we are to the truth. We may find that we're not as close as we thought we were, but at least now we know what the measure is supposed to be. That then brings us to freedom. We as Americans have a pretty good idea of what we think freedom is, too. It's the smallest amount of constraint to let us do whatever we want to. 
even if perhaps sometimes it means trading away things that we might like or value in order to have more autonomy. I thought about this coming back this morning. Uh, I had dinner with somebody last week and we were talking about uh, catching the train from Newark, which is a rare and not very convenient event. When they built the new train station, we were promised more set the trains to Philadelphia and we were promised marked trains to Baltimore, neither of which has materialized in part, I think, because we don't want to pay for it. We would prefer to be free from taxes rather than have the convenience of getting on the train to go where, where we want to go when we want to go there. Freedom is always in some ways about trade-offs. You may remember the Crosby, Stills, and Nash song from the 70s, you know, find the cost of freedom buried in the ground. What they were saying is that some people's freedom necessarily requires the death of other people. There is hidden in that a small clue to what Jesus is talking about. Because in some way, the death of Jesus is part of our freedom. Not freedom to say or do whatever we feel like, but our freedom from the, the power of sin. Our freedom from being held back by the things that otherwise are our own imperfections. Held back by the things that this world would lay upon us that keep us from being fully the children of God that we are intended to be. The freedom that we are promised is the freedom to be godly, to be godlike, not to become God, but at least to strive toward being as close to the measure of God's love and mercy and justice and gentleness and healing and wholeness as we possibly can be. So, dear friends, neither of these is really an easy thing to ask for. The truth that shows all things as they truly are. The freedom that enables us to strive toward what it is God desires. But what more could we ask for? What more could we want? Surely those are the things to be looking for in our own lives each day as we walk with Jesus. Amen.